Testing, testing, testing. This is a test. This is a test. are quite simple. Before we have time to assimilate, to digest one change, we have two or more changes thrust upon us. The reading of each day's newspaper or viewing of the TV screen is a daily reminder that we constantly are buffeted by global events, many of them out of our control, and that many of these events result from the applications of science or engineering. In such an age of unprecedented change, change molded and guided by developments in science and technology, I decided that it was necessary to communicate with the general public to try to inform them of the fascinating and amazing forces and processes that not only were shaping their lives, but also their children's lives. And so, as Dr. Gerstein indicated, more than 11 years ago, I joined the Los Angeles Times as its science editor. I deserted the relative calm and tranquil atmosphere of a university or industrial research laboratory. I had spent 12 years in teaching and research in universities and industry, and I entered the frenzied hustle and bustle of the city room of one of America's larger newspapers. It was quite a shock, this transition. 50 people in one large room with telephones ringing, teletypes clicking, a sort of turmoil unlimited. I now have returned to the California Institute of Technology, and at first I had problems of adjusting to the quietness of the academic atmosphere. And so, like Janus, the two-headed deity of ancient Rome, I came to wear two hats. I was both a scientist by training and a journalist by occupation. My remarks this afternoon will fall into two main categories. One, my personal experience as a scientist turned journalist, and two, my analysis of what science writing is. I shall not have time to discuss some hints for the popular writing of scientific and engineering subjects. I not only am director of science communication at Caltech, but I also am lecturer in the division of humanities and social sciences, and as such, I teach a one-quarter course in science writing. So first, I would like to relate my personal experience as a journalist. I have it on good authority that I really am not a newspaper man. Returning from the December 1964 meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science that was held in Montreal, the Canadian customs officer asked me my occupation. I replied, I'm science editor of the Los Angeles Times, and he said, open your bag. I did, he looked in and he exclaimed rather scornfully, you're no newspaper man, where's your bottle of brandy? <laughs> I also have it on even better authority that I was not a science writer. In a publication entitled A Guide to Careers in Science Writing, which is prepared and distributed by the National Association of Science Writers, a paragraph that described what a science writer is began, it's easiest to start with what a science writer is not. He is not a scientist. This now has been amended to read, most are not scientists. So I was not a newspaper man, nor was I a science writer, yet I carry the title of science editor of the newspaper with the largest circulation of standard-sized general newspapers in the United States. And what did I do? Simply put, I taught. I look upon myself as an educator, a teacher of the general public, for 11 years, eight years with the Los Angeles Times, and three years with Enterprise Science News of Newspaper Enterprise Association, I wrote a column about current events in world science and technology. If I write a particularly good and interesting column, I could have millions of people in my classroom. School children, housewives, and businessmen clipped and clipped my columns, passed them around, and discussed them. I feel strongly in this rapidly changing world that in spite of their deficiencies and shortcomings, newspapers are one of the few institutions remaining in the country that can and must assume the responsibility 
for informing the public about both the beauties and wonders of science and the beneficial and harmful implications and effects of technology. The electronic mass media of radio and television by and large do not fill this gap, especially in what is called prime time, the 7 to 10 p.m. weeknight program. Except for the presentation of occasional documentary films, which are, are unusual by their very rarity, the electronic media have defaulted this responsibility. If all the TV networks simultaneously could show the launch of a spaceship to the moon, then they certainly could devote one hour per month for the simultaneous showing of a debate or a discussion on the technologically spawned problems that profoundly will affect our future such subjects as computers and privacy, the headlong rush into nuclear fission energy to generate electricity, the newly won knowledge in biology that could result in the manipulation of our heredity or mind, or the use of cable television as an information utility to pump information into our homes the way electricity, the way electric utilities pump in electrons. And radio is not much better. In 1971, KABC Radio in Los Angeles gave me two one-minute programs each day to comment on environmental problems. After the first week, my time allotment was increased 50% to the grand total of one and one-half minutes per comment. Apparently, however, news and entertainment is preferred to information, and my commentary was canceled after a period of 13 weeks. But newspapers are another matter as put so well by James Reston of the New York Times in his book, The Artillery of the Press, in which he says, newspapers are no longer merely in the transmitting business, but also in the education business. Actually, the mass communications of this country prob probably have more effect on the American mind than all the schools and universities combined. And the problem is that neither the officials who run the government nor the officials who run the newspapers, nor the radio and television news programs have adjusted to that fact. It was this potentially powerful impact on the education of the public that led me to leave the laboratory and to join a newspaper to write about science and technology. I feel it is important to be on the front lines of mass education Above all, I wanted to inject something that was lacking in most newspaper stories dealing with science and technology, accuracy and clarity. Above all, I continuously strove to tell the story accurately and in a way that most people perhaps could understand. In many ways, writing for a newspaper is more challenging than teaching in a university, which I also do. A newspaper writer cannot wait until the subject matter appears in a textbook or monograph. My time constants were shorter. I dealt with experimental and observational events taking place in laboratories and research institutes and observatories and rainforests, in the oceans and in the heavens. And yet I felt that deadline speed in reporting most of the events of science and technology is not essential. From my scientific training, I know that if a piece of research is valid in science, it will be just as valid or even more valid one week from now or a month later. In science writing, accuracy is of the essence, not time. The value of a true scientific discovery is in its timelessness, not in its timeliness. For example, I often was aware of many interesting stories long before other science writers received news releases about them. Yet, I did not write about them until the scientists' work had appeared in technical journals because I respected the age-old tradition that a scientist first report his story to his peers. This waiting was difficult to do at times, but had I violated it, I could not have maintained the confidence that the scientific community had in my integrity and in my writing. Obviously, this is an atypical point of view for an editor who is interested in so-called scoops. In a typical week of my science writing activities, my work would consist of readings, interviews, and seminars dealing with topics ranging from the esoteric subtleties of quasi-stellar radio sources and other violent celestial phenomena, 
through applications of incredibly swift, high-speed electronic digital computers, to the amazing intricacies of the synthesis of proteins at the molecular level of DNA, messenger RNA, ribosomes, and transfer RNA. It was a hectic intellectual existence as my memory banks constantly were shifting from one subject to another. My newsbeat was the universe of atoms and men, that's the name of the column I wrote, dealt with the entire spectrum of human experience from gigantic galaxies through man himself to subatomic nuclei. Note that I make a distinction between science and technology. Science is interested in but two questions, what is nature like and why and how is it the way it is? Science seeks knowledge as a matter of curiosity and understanding. As such, science is not a compartmentalized activity, but is as much a part of the mainstream of human striving for fulfillment and betterment as our art, music, poetry, and literature. Science is the world of quasi-stellar radio sources, silkworm spinning cocoons of silk, the fact that matter is made up of discrete units called atoms, that heredity is passed on from one generation to the next by discrete units called genes, and that sunlight also comes in discrete packets called photons or quantum. Science replaces ugly rumors, beliefs, and speculations with the best facts then available. Is it not odd that a so-called educated person is embarrassed if he does not know who painted a particular canvas, who composed a particular symphony, or who wrote a particular book? Yet he cares little as to which variety of uranium atom, U-235 or U-238, undergoes fission with slow neutrons. That's a fact that could affect his whole future. Technology, on the other hand, is interested in how to use the resources of nature more effectively to satisfy the real or imagined needs and desires of men. It seeks knowledge as a matter of achieving a goal or a result. Thus, technology affects us all. Obviously, the material aspects of life should not and cannot be ignored in our attempts to achieve a betterment of the human condition. Technology is the world of the engineer and the physician. It is the world of computers, nuclear weapons, nuclear reactors, missiles, antibiotics, pesticides, jet airplanes, communication satellites, automobiles, contraceptives, and television sets. Science and technology have become greatly confused in this country. Thus, we have the ironic situation in which NASA, which represents a technological undertaking, keeps on trying to justify its existence on the contributions that it makes to science. And when scientists testify for science before Congress, they usually justify money for their research on the basis of whether their research is useful, a matter of technology. Here is the dilemma of modern science. The scientist wants to do science, but he essentially only can get funds to do technology. America now spends billions of dollars per year on activities conveniently lumped together as research and development, R&D. But if you look very closely, most of the money is for D and only very little is for R. It is technology and not science that is getting the lion's share of governmental, industrial, and university financial support. Dr. Kenneth S. Pitzer, the professor of chemistry and former president of Stanford University, has written, quote, the great generalizations about the properties of nature comprise some of the greatest intellectual achievements of mankind. Many scientists find their primary personal satisfaction in imaginative experiments and beautiful theories. The rest of society recognizes this cultural aspect and participate insofar as it can. But let there be no misunderstanding. Congress does not appropriate over a billion dollars a year for science primarily for the cultural enjoyment of descriptions of discoveries. It is the potential of applications of a useful nature that justifies the large sums of money." End of quote. This point of view by Dr. Pitzer is but an echo of what Galileo said 364 years ago. Galileo, who's considered the father of modern science, on the 7th of May, 1610, two months after he had first looked at the moon and wrote the publication of Nuncius Sidereus, the messenger of the stars, 
Galileo wrote a letter in which he said the following, quote, I have many and most admirable plans and devices, but they could only be put to work by princes because it is they who are able to carry on war, build and defend fortresses, and for their regal sport make most splendid expenditures, end of quote. So you see that things haven't changed much in three and a half centuries. You just substitute the word federal government for princes in Galileo's letter, and it becomes a most current, up-to-date comment. As a matter of fact, the global expenditures for science are inconsequential when one considers that each year the world now spends $200,000 million, $200 billion a year, for military expenditures. And that one fact alone overshadows all others in the shaping of our world today. So most of the money earmarked for science and technology goes to technology, and it is technology, not science, that gives rise to public issues, for it is the implementation of technology that affects society directly and profoundly. And this leads to confusion among the general public. The average man in the street, if there is such a person, cannot understand why scientists keep on asking for more money since he thinks that the billions of dollars per year spent on technology is being spent on science. And editors of news media and many science writers, being non-scientifically trained laymen themselves, are subject to the same confusion. Probably the first question that's asked by an editor when you approach him with a science story is, what good is it? So, a good deal of what passes as science in the news media, the manned space program, the use of computers, the removal of a president's gallstones, is not science at all, but more properly belongs in the realms of technology, economics, or art. In my opinion, this confusion between science and technology is detrimental to science, and as long as scientists themselves refuse to step forward to clear up the confusion, they will have trouble with funding. There is a great deal of commentary these days from scientists, because their funding has been cut back, that the country is being inundated by a wave of anti-intellectualism. I feel that this is utter nonsense, because in my opinion, the, co the country never was swept previously by a wave of intellectualism. <laughs> what, happened, what happened is that after World War II, Fresh with the atomic bomb development, a development of technology, Congress lavishly poured out money to scientists for more than two decades, not in an outburst of appreciation of intellectualism, but in the hope that if scientists could solve the nuclear weapon problem, then they perhaps could solve other major societal problems. But people problems are not physics problems. People don't behave like atomic nuclei. And so, with societal results only dimly perceived on the future horizon and incredible demands being made for federal money, the result was to be expected. The funding of science decreased. The golden era of science in post-World War II days sunk to a lower level, but it did not disappear. Federal funding of science still continues, albeit at a lower level. Because of the confusion of what science is, most of the newspaper stories written by members of the National Association of Science Writers are articles about medicine. Most of the remainder deal with technology. Only a few articles concern themselves with science. It obviously is not a valid example, but Mr. James A. Larson, science editor of the University Industry Research Program, examined the coverage of Wisconsin newspapers during the month of October 1971. Mr. Larson is at the University of Wisconsin. He writes, quote, less than 2% of newspaper coverage was devoted to descriptions of modern scientific and technological advances. He then adds, in a modern world dominated by science and technology, this lack of attention to a critical aspect of Western civilization is difficult to understand. And particularly since many readership surveys show that science and medicine consistently rate high in the interests of readers. Mr. Larson found that 2% of the newspaper stories that dealt with science and technology were divided as follows. 53% dealt with medicine and public health, 21% with the environment, 5% with engineering and the physical sciences, 2% with biological sciences, 3% with scientific celebrities, 
2% with animal behavior, 3% with industrial technology, and 2% with the earth sciences. There actually are three kinds of stories about science in the mass media. One is descriptive, as it tells how things are or how they work. And I would estimate probably about 80% of these are medical. Two are discoveries and how they affect people, that is the social implications of the research. And three is the politics of science, that is the funding, the propaganda, and the personality. Dan Greenberg, who is the country's foremost writer concerning the politics of science, has written a book entitled The Politics of Pure Science. And in it he says, in 1961 I joined the news department of science, the weekly news magazine of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. My assignment was to write about scientific affairs, but it was a particular aspect of science that I was to deal with. I was to write not about the substance, but rather about the politics of science. The substance is centered in the laboratory. The politics is centered in the committee room. The substance of science is unique to science, but the politics, except to the extent that it is flavored by the peculiar traditions of science, is not. Science, like agriculture, the military, labor, business, or the civil, civil rights movement, has its vested interests, elites, downtrodden, alliances, bosses, loves, and hates. End of quote. I decided to confine my writings to the first two categories, the substance of science and technology and its implications for society. But there are many problems facing a scientist involved in writing science and technology for a newspaper. Consider the problem of available space. A newspaper is a business enterprise and as such is legitimately entitled to make a profit. To do so, it carries both text and advertisements. About 15 to 35 percent of its space as text and 65 to 85 percent of its space as ads. By the word text, I mean everything other than ads, that is, stories, photographs, comic strips, obituaries, astrological horoscopes, stock market reports, and so forth. Incidentally, most newspapers carry an astrology column, but not a science column. And you might also be interested in, to know that there are many more astrologers employed in the United States than there are astronomers. Each day, therefore, in newspapers across the land, there is a vigorous competition for the available text space, choices to be made among stories de written dealing with X-ray astronomy, lasers, or hemoglobin, and stories announcing the sudden arrival of Elizabeth Taylor at the airport, or a crash on a highway that claimed seven lives, or some public official who has been indicted for bribery. The line editors, those actively engaged in getting any paper out con constantly must make decisions as to what to print. Almost always they decide in favor of Elizabeth Taylor freeway crashes and bribery indictments. And this perhaps is the way it should be, but it is terribly frustrating to a science writer and to other specialty writers. There was one famous science writer who indicated that he could get any story into a newspaper as long as it dealt with either ulcers, heart trouble, hemorrhoids, or sexual impotency, for every editor suffered from at least one of these errors. <laughs> Only a handful of American newspapers, however, devote a relatively high percentage of their available space to news of science and technology, and only a handful have actual science editors working for them. It is even more discouraging to return from a technical meeting attending an out-of-town scientific or technical meeting to find that of several stories written and filed, only a few appeared in print. Some of the stories, perhaps, were not considered to be hard news. So the topics, as science, a science writer may have considered to be important, may not be considered to be news by the line editors, and conversely, what often is considered news by the editors may not be considered important by a science writer. But what is worse than the competition for available text space is when a story was cut or rewritten and printed with your byline indicating your authorship. Needless to say, this can and did lead to unpleasant experiences. A science writer for a newspaper not only is faced with the above difficulties, but with the most difficult choice of all, what to write about. As a Janus of the pen, 
Which subject should I write about? What should I teach the public? It is a difficult choice to make, for each day a journalist for a large metropolitan newspaper is deluged by a flood of information, by journal and magazine articles, books, press releases, telephone calls, personal visits, etc. And I conducted interviews with scientists, attended local and national seminars, meetings, and symposia. And in true rugged journalistic individuality, a remnant of the days of suspenders and green-tinted cap visors, I was not provided with a secretary, nor are many of the editors provided with a secretary. Not having a secretary, it took me about one half hour just to slit open and glance at my daily mail, let alone to read it. Obviously, even with the best of intentions, a goodly portion of my mail went unanswered. I would dread to return to my desk if I were absent a week. I shuddered if it was a month. Incidentally, some of the letters I received belong in a miscellaneous category best described as kook mail. Several times a month, I received documents from people dealing with the overthrow of Einstein's theories, the invention of perpetual motion machines, diatribes against Darwinian evolution, still hot stuff, exceedingly imaginative and equally bizarre solutions to the Los Angeles smog problem, and why was I neglecting such important topics as ESP or UFOs or fluoridation of water supplies and so forth. But the letters I cherished most are from the planetary travelers. If I wrote a story dealing with Mars or Venus, I was certain to receive one or two letters the following week from people who had just returned from there. <laughs> one correspondent even sent me illustrated pamphlets describing what he had seen and observed. I once suggested to NASA that they contact him. You see, it is a very difficult problem because I was always humble about this particular problem. You may recall that when Einstein published his ideas about the universe, his model of the universe, he was a patent clerk in the Swiss patent office at the time. Now suppose a patent clerk would call you, your sign setter of the newspaper says, say, I have a very good idea what the universe is like. And you say, yes, uh, what school are you associated with? Say, well, I'm not in school, I'm just a patent clerk. And you probably would hang up on him. So it was this one aberration, I realize it was an unusual one, that kept me honest. I would look at almost all of the uh, suggestions that were sent in. I could weed out those that were absolutely ridiculous from those that may have had some merit, and those that did, I then sent to some of my colleagues in the area for further evaluation. The other problem is, who is the public for whom I write? It is a tremendously diverse spectrum, ranging from the functionally illiterate sitting in front of their TV to those with several years of higher education sitting in front of their TV. <laughs> I once attended a conference in Washington where Gunnar Myrdal was the speaker, and after he got through, he held a press conference. And as he held the press conference, he was first interviewed by television. And of course, they wouldn't have pooled services. First CBS interviewed him, then NBC, and then ABC. And then he was interviewed by the radio people. And then CBS radio interviewed him, and uh, NBC radio and ABC. So he's, he's now given the answers six times to the same question that we asked him. He got through, he turned to us, he says, gentlemen of the press, and now for the people who can read. <laughs> well, shortly after I assumed my position, I decided that not only would I cover a broad general spectrum of science and technology, but I also would concentrate my efforts in six particular science and technology associated areas that I felt were major problems facing mankind. And they are, overpopulation, the ever-widening economic gap among nations, the global pollution of our environment, computers, nuclear energy, and molecular biology. The first five are matters of technology, the last is a basic science. As I look back now, I would have broadened one category to have included energy in general, and would have added a seventh category called communications. You know, with communication satellites now, they really will revolutionize a good deal of the way we do things in the world. And as you know, just a few weeks ago, we orbited the first domestic communication satellite for the United States, that is just for messages for the United States. They really will affect us greatly. We will all be living in a goldfish bowl. There will be no boondocks left, no place to hide. Can you just imagine the Israelites wandering in the desert now 
for 40 years, every hour on the hour there would be a news report about where they were and what they were doing. There now are 3.86 billion fellow human passengers walking the crust of spaceship Earth, and 26 years hence, at the turn of the 21st century, this number is expected to almost double. The population increase between now and the year 2000 is expected to be almost as large as is the entire world population today. Now, one need not be very clairvoyant to realize that this is the most cru crucial problem confronting humanity, ranking alongside such problems as potential extinction by thermonuclear holocaust, to which I shall return shortly. Incidentally, here is one area where the mass media has done an excellent job of education, of making the world aware of the population explosion. We were way ahead of the politicians who only this year, this August, 1974, will meet in Bucharest, Romania to, for the first world population year discussion. To those inhabitants who occupy those sections of spaceship Earth called underdeveloped nations, the continuing increase in human numbers represents a precarious balance between near hunger and starvation, between poverty and extreme want. They all find themselves in the position of the Red Queen and through the looking glass, they have to run faster and faster just to stay in the same place. According to the 1973 World Population Data Sheet put out by the Population Reference Bureau Incorporated, the per capita share of the gross national product in the United States was $4,760 last year. And in India, $110 last year. If you divide these GNP per C figures, $4,760 by the $110, you get a ratio of about 40. Obviously, these figures indicate an economic gap, and this gap continues to widen. The rich developed nations are getting richer faster than the poor underdeveloped nations are getting richer. At the upper extreme, you have the United States with 5.5% of the world's population, somewhere about 210 million Americans, using up more than a third of the world's materials and one third of the world's energy resources. Nor are rich countries immune to the stresses of overpopulation and economic development. Those inhabitants who occupy the compartments of spaceship Earth, known as developed nations, are faced with an ever-increasing deterioration of their environment. It is no accident that the crises in pollution and, the, and energy came at about the same time. Environmental problems are intimately related to the use or misuse of our energy and material resources. We are living in an age of exponential increase. Although we have been mining coal for 800 years, we have burned one half of all the coal mined in the last 32 years. And although we've been pumping oil out of the ground for about 120 years, We've burned one half of all the oil pumped out of the ground in the last 14 years. You may be interested that the 4.2 million cars registered in Los Angeles County burn 8.7 million gallons of gasoline per day, which profoundly affects the quality of Los Angeles air. Yet, however, we must admit that man's controlled release of energy to run engines and motors has done more to get rid of human slavery than all of the Sunday sermons put together. Now, just as engines and motors have relieved us of muscular tasks, we now have machines that release, uh, relieve us of mental tasks as computers. An electronic digital computer only does two things. It can do arithmetic and it can store and keep track of numbers. But it does both of these things swiftly, accurately, reliably, and tirelessly. Numbers represent a convenient way to express all kinds of information, a monologue from Hamlet, lines from a Tennyson poem, vivid colors of a Van Gogh painting, a black and white photograph of the planet Mars, the shape of a rose petal, the beating of a human heart, the movement of traffic in a city, the rise and fall of tides, or the mixing of batter for a chocolate cake. Thus, since a computer handles numbers and numbers are information, a computer really is an information handling machine. It is these abilities of the computer to store large amounts of information and to handle them swiftly that permit digital computers working with analog computers to be prime tools of automation in the control of petroleum refineries, chemical plants, steel rolling mills, bakeries, and so forth. And with great amounts of personal information stored within them, information that can be retrieved swiftly and efficiently, 
computers are certain to be used to infringe upon our traditional privacies in the future. The electronic dossier is very much with us today. And since we are bound and determined to put all of our financial transactions into the computer, and since the mafia can hire computer and electronic experts, we shortly may read headlines of the great electronic bank robbery. We already have had fraud committed with computers in the insurance business, and we already have witnessed the disappearance of Penn Central's freight cars, cars whose disposition and location were under computer control. And if the computer leads us into the cashless society, then as it becomes more and more difficult to steal cash in a cashless society, then the theft of property and even of people will go up. And of course, we're seeing this right now where the tendency is to turn toward property and kidnapping rather than what used to be uh, Willie Sutton's point of view when he was asked, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. No university or college student should be permitted to obtain a degree without some exposure to a course that describes what computers are able to do. Not the technical details of how they operate, but what can man do with them? For there certainly is a computer in everyone's future. The twin developments of nuclear fission and thermonuclear fusion have created the very real possibility of mankind destroying itself by its own hands. By next year, the United States will have enough deliverable thermonuclear warheads to destroy the USSR more than 25 times over. And the Soviet Union will have enough thermonuclear warheads to destroy us 16 times over. We now have a balance of terror, euphemistically called the stable deterrent, in which New York City, in which US cities, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Washington are being held thermonuclear hostages by the Soviet Union and the Soviet cities, Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, Vladivostok, are being held thermonuclear hostages by the United States. And yet at the same time, this awesome might, this sort of Damocles hanging over our heads, gives us the first basis for the prospect of a world without war, a world where generalized global warfare fought with nuclear weapons would be de detrimental to the very survival of both biological and cultural life. And during the last decade, nuclear fission has made tremendous strides and may stand on the threshold of fulfilling its off-stated promise of unlimited economical energy through the burning of rocks. Yet, there still are some unanswered severe questions to the commercial acceptability of nuclear fission for the generation of electricity. And there is hope that thermonuclear fusion, the energy that now powers the stars, may at some time in the near future provide limitless energy through the burning of water. Perhaps in this audience today is a future Prometheus who will kindle the celestial fires of controlled thermonuclear fusion right here on Earth. It will be a magnificent boon to mankind. One out of every 6,500 hydrogen atoms in ocean water is a deuterium atom suitable for the controlled release of thermonuclear fusion energy. There is enough energy in the deuterium in one gallon of ocean water equivalent to the energy in 300 gallons of gasoline. Imagine 300 Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian oceans filled with gasoline. The mastery of controlled thermonuclear fusion could put the age-old quest for the brotherhood of man on a firm physical foundation. In only five short years, from 1961 to 1966, Scientists completely deciphered the genetic code, the vital relationship between the linear arrangements of purine and pyrimidine bases in DNA genes and the sequence of amino acids in proteins. Each gene, as a unit of heredity, contains information coded into its constituent bases that permits a cell to construct proper proteins. And proteins are necessary to life to carry out a cell's function. We are what we are because of our proteins, and they are determined by our genes. This is the greatest scientific triumph of the decade and is pregnant with all sorts of potential applications. It also can open up a Pandora's box of both beneficial and harmful manipulation of the genes of humans and of fellow creatures and plants. We potentially could control such genetic aberrations as cancer, diabetes, and schizophrenia. We also potentially could open up our eons old genetic heritage to manipulation by humans with interests other than those of medical benefits, a most sobering thought. 
The ongoing explosion in biological knowledge is a story that bears careful watching and reporting as it develops with the emphasis on actual developments and not on wild speculation. And the same is true of brain research. Dr. Seymour Ketty of Harvard University feels that manipulation of the brain by television programs is far more a threat and worrisome than the manipulation of the brain by chemicals or electrical stimuli. I chose to write specifically about the above subjects because I felt that people should know about them. Apparently, the choices were pertinent for many of the above topics that were discussed gingerly and cautiously, if at all, when I began to write about them 11 years ago, now are common everyday news. But in addition to these relevant topics, I felt that people also should know about the joys of the scientific experience. I cannot express this better than was done by the late Dr. Robert Oppenheimer when he said, quote, we scientists have a modest part to play in history and the barriers between us and the men of affairs, the statesmen, the artists, the lawyers, with whom we should be talking could perhaps be markedly reduced if more of them knew a little of what we were up to, knew it with pleasure and some confidence. I have often thought that with the historic gain so grand and so uncertain, we should not dismiss any help even of that small part which we scientists could play." End of quote. So we scientists have something unique to offer the public, for all of us as scientists have experienced the joy and insight of discovery, of becoming aware of a little nook or cranny of nature previously unknown to anyone. Dr. Oppenheimer continues, the experience of a scientific discovery is a good and beautiful experience and an unforgettable one. We know that this is true even of the little discoveries and we understand with the great discoveries it is shattering. It was on his 71st birthday that Einstein said to me, when it has once been given to a man to do some sensible things, afterwards his life is a little different. Dr. Oppenheimer concluded, it seems not really an act of arrogance, but simply human, to wish these pleasures for as many of our fellows as can have them. End of quote. What a poignant phrase the small part that we could play in the grand uncertain game of history. We must not forget that we are a woefully small minority. Perhaps if you think of 300,000 scientists, that's 0.15% of the American population. And in any specific discipline, there are even less. You know, at the Federation of the Association uh, of Scientific uh, uh, it's, I can't remember the, the full name of it, it's F-A-S-E-B is the abbreviation for these biological societies. And each, the week before Easter, they always have a meeting in Atlantic City where 25,000 biologists descend upon Atlantic City. And it must seem to them that the world is full of biologists. And actually it is for that week in Atlantic City, but otherwise they're a very small part of the population. To most scientists, the universe as it exists is far more intriguing than any fanciful mythology invented by storytelling man. Dr. Richard P. Feynman, who's the 1965 Nobel Prize winner in physics, and the Richard Chase, Chase Tolman Professor of Theoretical Physics at the California Institute of Technology, even waxes poetic. He says, quote, the imagination of nature is far, far greater than the imagination of man. For instance, how much more remarkable it is for us all to be stuck, half of us upside down, by a mysterious attraction to a spinning ball that has been swinging in space for billions of years than to be carried on the back of an elephant supported on a tortoise swimming in a bottomless sea." End of quote. It is pleasant to write about the universe in which we find ourselves, for the universe is a thing of beauty a joy forever and its wonders are many.